emergency number in the United States, if you dial 911, the telephone company will always allow the police to track that because if you're in the middle of an emergency and they lose the signal, they have to be able to figure out how to find you. An issue related to that, which one might call the uh, sensor-based computing on steroids, is the concept of cloud computing, what's often called in Europe the Internet of Things, in Asia often ubiquitous computing. Um, you have virtual worlds as one of the aspects of that. And here, one of the issues that really comes into play is the issue of jurisdiction. Because what you really find is there's less of a geographic basis for data and the processes related to data. You also have issues uh, which are coming up, especially in virtual worlds, of taxation and criminality. So there have been German courts that are prosecuting crimes that occur in virtual worlds. And there are questions by tax authority as to how you deal with taxation of monetized value in virtual worlds. And these are emerging issues which are issues that law is beginning to deal with, but realistically has an ill-suited history of how to deal with these issues because some of the grounding on which they base themselves, which is usually what jurisdiction did this take place in, are much less easy to associate. In the same sense, we have some of the foundation issues of things we thought we understood completely being brought into question again. So when you look at IPv6 uh, or uh, search engines, we have uh, Article 29 in the European Commission trying to do explorations of what is personally identifiable information and particularly what is the legal status of an IP address and can it give you linkage to personal information. That's a cutting edge issue that is going on now without a resolution but with lots of hearings um, and there's quite a bit of heat related to that issue. Um, since we're in India, it's only appropriate to talk about some global information flows, business process outsourcing, uh, issues that relate to cryptography and a number of other technologies. And really what you get into that mix is the idea of how obligations flow with information and how you associate those concepts and how you develop an accountability framework. So the European Directive, for instance, has existed uh, since the 80s. You have uh, privacy law in many of the European countries preceding that. You've had sectoral privacy legislation in the United States. Uh, India is going through the passage of the IT Act amendments. All of these are issues looking at that. But you have two theories that seem to be percolating to the top. One of them in the European Directive of Adequacy, one of them coming out of the APEC region and also ensconced in the Canadian law of accountability. The accountability concept being that obligation flows with the information as opposed to I have to find your legislation adequate before I permit a, a data transfer. And so you have different schools of how these legislations are working, and yet both schools have come to a very similar bridge solution. In the European Union, you have the development of cross-border privacy rules. I mean, I'm sorry, of uh, binding corporate rules. And in the Asia-Pacific region, you have the, de the development of cross-border privacy rules. And both of them are ways of saying companies have global information flows they have to manage and have to wait, make, find ways of rationalizing these global information flows and these contracts that cover the entire system may be one of the ways to look at those issues. The other issue which the data flows in cryptography uh, bring up um, is the issue of data breach and a number of laws are starting to discuss whether or not you need a disclosure with data breach, what kind of remedies are available with data breach. So that is a hot topic of legislative drafting uh, at the moment. As the, at the same time that you look at cryptography, which sometimes gives you a safe harbor against data breach disclosures, uh, you also have the idea of governments from national security perspectives going back and revisiting the concepts of key escrows or depositing information related to strong authentication. And that becomes a legal issue of how you deal with those and how you deal with security. A same kind of tension exists in the idea of workplace monitoring and surveillance. So when you think about the fact that in every privacy law you have an option to protect your customer information, one of the ways you may protect it is by deploying some technologies in the workplace. Yet there are expectations of privacy in the workplace, so you have an inherent tension and you have a legal problem because you have contracts where you've made 
uh, affirmative representations to your customers about data protection, while at the same time you often have agreements with works councils or other organizations about employee expectations of privacy in the workplace, and you have to legally manage both of those expectations and obligations. Similarly, between civil liberties and national security, we find that there is more and more of a give and take and the question of what is appropriate process, uh, issues like the Patriot Act, issues like the RIP Act in the UK, are things that have become more and more part of the mix of uh, legal issues and then on top of that you have Freedom of Information Act issues which come into play. As, you, as we go more towards global workforces with modular processes and workflows, we find more and more the possibility of conflicts of laws. And that's happening, a couple of no, uh, cases of notoriety that have happened recently are the e-discovery cases. So discovery laws in the US are not at all similar to discovery laws in Europe. And privacy laws in the EU often run afoul of discovery requests in the US. Uh, and I will tell you, it is very difficult to explain to either a data protection authority what an e-discovery law is, or to a US judge what a, what a European Data Protection Act requirement is. And bridging that gap has become a significant legal issue uh, between, the two, between the US and the EU. You also had the situation of the whistleblower case. So Sarbanes-Oxley was a law in the US that required you to have an anonymous line so that you could say if you were being harassed or otherwise coerced as an employee. But in the European Union, there was a requirement that you have a declaration of who you are if you are making such a complaint, that it shouldn't be anonymous. Uh, so there have been a lot of workarounds on the legal side to actually make sure that you can comply with both sets of laws. But more and more, you find companies finding themselves between that mix of obligations, uh, which are often uh, conflicting. The, the other thing, and, and this goes back a little bit to the security and the crypto, is, and it was mentioned before uh, by the panel as well, the concept of what is the appropriate level of law to be written so that is actually useful. Because in some cases, law goes to a detailed level of micromanagement that either makes it inappropriate or very short-lived. And there really has to be a legal drafting issue of what is the appropriate level of law. Things like the OECD guidelines are very interested because 30 years after their publication, they still have a valid remit um, within the context of privacy, but the guidelines are written at a higher level than law. So when we look at law, we have to figure out what is the appropriate drafting level. Another issue that was already touched on, again, uh, by the panel, is issues of electronic documents, electronic signatures, and electronic contracting. And here you have the ideas of how that implicates notarization, self-proving documents, but the most interesting thing that comes up is proof requirements over time. We are ill-equipped when we look at these issues because we have not dealt with electronic documents in a thought process that says this document will survive for 30 years or a lifetime. So as you think of an electronic birth certificate, an electronic health record, uh, employment portfolios, real estate records, as these become electronic, they live for a long period of time and you have to think about how to prove them in court over that long period of time, which means you need to figure out how to, you, can, you can present them in a way that was equivalent to the way they were created. Uh, some technologies help with that, but no technologies still are immutable on these issues. And you have to think about how that presentation does and how you actually deal with the electronic proof. As you look at things like health records and employment portfolios that last a long period of time and contain a lot of information, you also start thinking about ecosystem issues. And there you get into issues of federation and identity management. Uh, and with those issues, you have to figure about what is the contractual framework that binds underneath those ecosystems. Because it's often easy to bind what I will call the first hop or the interaction between you and the first player. But now we're dealing with value chains of players. Now we're dealing with extended networks of players. And how do you create contractual bindings across them? Because in many cases, it's easy to deal with, the, with who you're in privity with. It's much harder to deal with your extended contractual chain. So you start having to think of contractual frameworks like the frameworks that the credit card companies use where you have a binding concept for all the players that is actually fairly elaborate in order to capture a lot of these issues because we still haven't come to, the, uh, to a mastery of how to do dynamic contracting in those kind of environments. 
Uh, in that same realm, we have to think about how identity management and some of these federated systems can also work in anonymization and pseudonymization, pseudonymization and how those issues work with contracting where you actually have to identify people. So are there attributes you can use for the contracting? And these are again issues where technology and law meet and where there isn't a resolution because we're really dealing with new topics. Uh, lastly, an issue that was again dealt with on the panel previously is the concept of digital products. And digital products has been a term that tries to bridge the idea of goods that may have become electronic but still act a lot like goods. So if I sell a, p a piece of software on a disk versus I download the software, there's an argument as to whether you have a good or service. Yet there is a different argument that says perhaps it's a digital product that should be treated as if it's a good even though it lacks the definition of a tangible medium which is required for a good in trade definitions. So here you have issues from a legal perspective related to classification in the World Trade Organization and the World Customs Organizations, which are important for the application of taxes and duties, uh, as well as how the, uh, the International Technology Agreement would apply to those and deal with those issues. So in essence, that's just kind of a brief overview of some of the major technology trends and some of the legal issues. And I think what we're seeing is there's an interrelation, because while I may have given you 10 different items, in many ways, this is a continuum of issues that is now working more and more together as we look at these more integrated platforms on the internet. And I think that in some ways makes the issues tremendously interesting, but also more complex to solve. It also means that the consumer or the end user sees less of this entire chain. And so from a fairness perspective, you also have to figure out how to make sure that that person is dealing with enough information to make informed choices uh, related to some of these obligations that are coming up. Uh, I think with that, all of us have spoken quite a long time, and perhaps it's time to give uh, the word to the audience. Thank you, Joe. Cyber Law Trends of 2009. I'd like to open up the, uh, the floor for any questions, any clarifications, any perspectives that you have. The hand has begun, so let me go from the uh, uh, right front here. Can you please identify yourself, your name? Uh, which emerged even from the statement you read from Alexander is that the law, if it's going to be to stand the test of time, should be technology neutral. Yet you also st stated that some of the laws we have are not appropriate for mobile technology. So uh, is, is this concept of a technology neutral law are visible? Uh, that is my question. Thank you. The only legal technology uh, that's necessary and legal in India for electronic authentication. Now that's a case of a country having a technology specific legislation. What uh, Alexander was talking was a technology neutral legislation where you don't endorse a particular technology but all kinds of technology will have the same level playing field. As far as my com comment and observation on uh, the applicability of cyber law to mobile phones, well mobiles may be a kind of technology but mobile ultimately is a kind of a computing device which is a data processing device which has got memory functions which does precisely the same functions as that of a computer. So a mobile would not be seen as a technology but would merely be seen as a kind of a computer device or a computer uh, in the eyes of law. Anyone else in the, uh, in the panel who would like to take this question? Okay, would like to see? Uh, Joe. No, okay. The content and which makes perfect sense and there are also provisions uh, which state that there's no uh, special obligation to monitor. Uh, the only exception is that the ISP having actual knowledge or it is reasonable to expect uh, that uh, actual knowledge should be the case. Uh, then again, the ISPs which choose to be good Samaritans and uh, actually monitor or at least advertise as, for example, child-friendly, or if they choose to monitor the content, they're more likely to be held liable. I find it really interesting, and I wanted to actually know your ideas. The other thing about cyberbullying, I think uh, still the most effective mechanism should be uh, the notice and takedown pr pr uh, procedures, 
But how can an effective notice and take down pro uh, procedure should be uh, designed? I would also like to learn the technical point of view. Thank you. Actually, outreach to the kids. And there are a number of organizations that have started doing that to try to actually make the kids aware and make sure that they do notify someone if this happens, because usually they're isolated, it continues, and then some harm occurs, uh, often that's irreversible. So, uh, you know, part of the notice takedown problem is this issue has a particularly negative consequence because people don't often talk about it. Uh, I think in terms of, and I, actually I'll, I'll apologize because I've forgotten what the first part of the question is by answering the she second. Was, yeah, she was talking about the liability of ISPs, uh, no. the choice between good sanitarians and not being liable at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I think part of it also started to become <coughs> the volume of information that exists and the inability to actually scan it in an effective way. And rather than give a false impression that someone is able to actually go through all of this information, I think people are giving a much more accurate impression but I think what the ISPs are doing in order to try to still be good Samaritans is they are building toolkits that both kids and parents can use. But again, it's the problem of that's not necessarily a solution if the kids aren't using them. Um, and you know, part of the problem is some of those toolkits aren't necessarily seen as cool things to do. Uh, and there's peer pressure on how to use those. But I think uh, I know a number of people who are privacy officers and ISPs, and I can tell you these are things they think about, worry about, and try to address. Uh, and I think they're trying to do the best they can, but it's a tough problem that, that needs more work. Thank you. Anyone else in the panel would like to speak? Would you like to yeah. comment? Yeah. Can I just add to what uh, Joseph said about ISP liability? The rationale of exempting ISPs from liability is the fact that you cannot expect them to be aware of everything that passes through their networks, considering there are millions and millions of web pages that go through them. That exemption ceases to exist the moment they have actual knowledge, as you rightly pointed out. So if they um, hold themselves out as someone who has some sort of editorial control over content, then the, uh, the, that liability cannot apply. If you see that from a Euro European perspective, the Commerce Directive, Article 12, grants ISP liability, uh, exempt, exempts ISP from liability as long as they do not have actual knowledge of the content. Um, so it, to me, it comes down to um, exercising editorial control. So when they actually say there's a family from the ISP, if that means they're monitoring content, then they cannot claim, and they should not be able to claim liability either. Wait, you want to, uh, we have, you have a comment to make? Um, uh, maybe just to add on, on ISP liability, that has already been uh, said by my colleagues. Yeah. Uh, well, um, the question of ISP liability is, has been always a, a critical. Uh, the question is how to put ISP liable. Uh, if you look uh, on some of the jurisdiction, look at the laws, they are given limited immunity or limited liability, they will always base on the, on the question of knowledge, whether they have knowledge on that, uh, if it is illegal mat material. Because they facilitate access to illegal materials. So this has been always a debate, starting from the, the famous case, NAPSA from the US, there was the whole uh, debate on the question of knowledge. Thank you. You want to say, yeah, Petrus? Yes. Uh, this whole area of um, ISP or I, I heard the other day uh, the mobile service providers or there may be a whole different groups that are providing services as the years go along and we might have an opportunity to clarify it and the initial sort of low-hanging fruit was in the copyright area now some of the discussions I've had are the more general business level discussions and one of the mantra the uh, researchers had was access to perform stated operations on sequence of bits, where you had operations such as aggregation, uh, conversion, transformation, some that would be neutral of what it was that was being communicated. I mentioned before about the uh, global uh, framework for bills of lading, but there might be a whole panoply in the health services, your health records, and the actual equivalent of the common carriage and how that all evolves 
the communications law has uh, been very slow to do the general framework. And I think at some point we have to step back and take a look at that whole area. Uh, as I said, they rushed to get the stuff in for the uh, copyright specific, but I, I think there's a crying need for some more general um, understandings in this environment. So perhaps we have another opportunity to look at the issue that you raised about the, uh, the Good Samaritan. Uh, only to add, the, uh, add a brief point that uh, it might be worth looking at the latest Council of Europe guidelines. Uh, it might be worth looking at the Council of Europe guidelines on uh, ISP cooperation that was adopted a couple of months ago uh, to uh, address some of the issues. It's available in the CO, coe.int website. Thank you. So indeed, it's a, it's a Pandora's box of a debate on ISP and different uh, panelists have given their own version. We ha we let me go for the next question. Can you identify yourself and your yeah. question? Uh, I'm Lord Brown from I9 Holdings Indian Forum. Mr. Dugal, I have a question for you uh, regarding the development of cyber laws in the Indian context. In 2008, we had a case when a technical guy uh, in Pune was arrested for posting some slanderous content on our court and that guy did not do anything however the mistake was of the ISP for giving the wrong IP. Do you see any development or any modification of uh, the cyber laws being done so as to uh, you know protect the innocent people and the people uh, you know uh, the people who enforce the law so that they do not end up uh, unnecessarily or you know, because of the lack of technical ability harassing the people or doing something which should not be done. Thank you for that question. I think uh, that was indeed a disaster. Uh, the ISP giving uh, the details of the so-called person who put up on the blog as Mr. ABC. Mr. ABC was a software engineer. He was arrested. 50 days after his arrest, after he was behind bars, the service provider came back to the police and saying, oops, we made a mistake. It's not ABC, it's XYZ. So the police released ABC and picked up XYZ. Now for that, the, just an update on this is that Mr. ABC, who was a software engineer and whose life has been devastated by this, has filed a claim for 100 million rupees against the service provider. And that's currently pending. And that's primarily so because of the liability of network service providers uh, for third party data. And when in this case, the network service provider gave a wrong um, identification of the concerned IP address on the date and time, the liability was clearly that of the service provider. I see no way how the service provider is going to run out of the liability. It might be a, a test case in the times to come. But regarding your question, as to whether any changes need to be made, I completely endorse your thought process that yes, changes need to be made. Why? The changes need to be made under section 81 and 84 of the IT Act, which primarily says that if you are a police officer and if you're doing anything in persons to the investigation of a cyber crime, then you would not be held liable for anything that you do, provided you only state what you did was in good faith and in the performance of your duties. Now hold on, every police officer is going to say, I investigated in good faith and in performance of my duties. And the moment he says that, he has got a blanket chit to go scot-free clean. I don't think that kind of a, a cleanliness certificate needs to be given by the law. I'm very, very clear that the law needs to be now amended to make the errant police officers liable in case if they are going to expose innocent bona fide netizens and normal citizens to exposure of unnecessary undesirable consequences for no fault of theirs. So I think the law needs to be amended. The government has been sensitized. We'll have to wait what the government finally gives uh, a final go on that regard. Thank you. Is there any other question? Okay. With, um, you know, whether or not uh, developing countries in effect face the same issues uh, and in terms of that, whether or not the same solutions would be prudent in that case related to cybercrime. Now, I'm just wondering because uh, given the discussion that we've had this afternoon, um, first of all, I take note that um, in terms of the emerging issues that have been discussed, to me, it would sound more like uh, these are issues that are quite common globally. Um, and when I uh, relate them to Tuesday's discussion, I find it difficult to reconcile the fact that um, from the discussion as I understood it, 
uh, it, it appeared that, um, you know, the forum was more for the view that, you know, developing countries actually may not face the same issues and of course may not need the same solutions, so that at the end of the day in drafting their own legislation relating to, to cybercrime, that should be taken into account. But again, given this afternoon's forum, I'd like, you know, I'd appreciate comments from, you know, uh, yourselves on what exactly you would think on that. You know, is it really the case that in fact we should not be looking at, you know, same issues to do with developing countries, same solutions, same solutions I do identify with that to some degree. But in terms of the issues, it would appear to me that in fact these issues are really the same. And especially given that we're looking at them from the futuristic perspective, you know, 2009 onwards. Um, thank you. It's the human skin on Cook Islands is exactly the same. This is the same sunshine that goes on to the United States and hits under the skin of US citizens. The sunlight doesn't change. It's, it's the response to sunlight that changes. In the Cook Islands, they could possibly have straw umbrellas. In America, they have automated umbrellas. The, it is the approaches of how you want to tackle with an existing uh, reality is what really distinguishes your approach from someone else. So when you say that these issues that we talked about are nothing new, well, yes, to that extent, there's nothing new. Well, when the sun sets on 31st of December 2008 and uh, rises again on 1st of January 2009, it'll be the same sun, it'll be the same planet, it'll be the same people, it'll be the same countries. Well, yes, what will really change will be the way how you will deal with the emerging opportunities of that particular year. So there's no way you can't say, look, look, we've done with cybercrime, we've done with data protection, we've done with privacy, hold on, let's start something new. That won't really happen because the world, it may happen for some group of individuals, but the world is only developing upon internet as it has already developed. The internet is not going away, uh, much that we, you or anybody else may desire. So it's the same network, it's the same issues. Yes, how developing countries will face them will be a different issue. To give an example, it's an economic slowdown. It's a recession, official recession in the US. Hold on, it's, it's really that bad. The people say it's, it's back to the 1920s. Hold on, but is the position same in developing countries? I don't think so. Developing countries will be impacted, but not to that extent. Since so in India, the legal process outsourcing industry is laughing their way to the bank. Why? Because they say, hold on, we've never had it so good before. And this is, we're going to have bumper crop this time. Why? Because come what may, when everybody is cutting their costs, it's going to be the outsourcing industry, the legal process outsourcing, the business process outsourcing industry that's going to prosper. So in every opportunity, in, in every kind of a challenge, there is an opportunity and how countries respond to those challenges will really determine their fate uh, in, the, in the path of progress. So I think the, the major issues will still continue to be the same till such time the final word is said on them. Look, we don't debate today about how to ignite fire. But that possibly was a big debate amongst human mankind in the Stone Age. They didn't know how to, how to control fire. But over the years, over the millenniums, we found, look, fire was our slave and we could effectively use it. So therefore, man, mankind moved on to bigger challenges. So till such time, the final word is not set on these major challenges pertaining to the internet. I think uh, the world will still continue to debate about them, except that the challenges, the approaches to the set challenges will be different. Well, it's said we will not make the same mistakes again. Developing countries can actually take care of the curve and can actually leapfrog by identifying what are the mistakes done by the nations by not repeating the mistakes and leaping forward. But clearly, at the end of the day, it has to be got to basic uh, issues that still confront the internet. I'll open this up uh, to the panel. Uh, Jaita? Just to add to what um, Pawan said, I think uh, I agree with Pawan and the statement made by you uh, from Zambia on the points you made and, and the, that the issues are common, but the way we address them may change from one country to another. So the enforcement, enforcement approaches may differ. But when it comes to cross-border, multi-jurisdictional mutual cooperation, countries have been challenged not to work in isolation and to look at harmonization. So we are living in a harmonized environment, and that's a message that I want to uh, give to 
the, the, the lady who asked that question. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Is there any other question in the audience? Well, thank you ever so much, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our distinguished panelists who've uh, spared their valuable times. I have learned a lot. I've made lots of notes while these panelists were talking. Uh, I have effectively found that each new perspective has brought on the table a new vision, a new way of looking at things. Of course, issues will be uh, different, issues will be same. It's the manner of how you look at these issues will ultimately distinguish what your approach is going to be vis-a-vis -vis others. But thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us at this workshop and wish you all the best for the last day of the workshop and uh, the IGF. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>